the hunter-warrior is on a journey without end. She appropriates herself as doomed to tread the razor's edge, balancing between the terror of being a human being and the wonder of being a human being. It is an endless trek because it is itself its own endless end. She knows there's no goal and no ultimate finish. The walk itself she believes to be her completion and final fulfillment. So she journeys forever this way of dread and fascination in the world of no illusion. When the first human being crawled out of the first cave, she immediately was encountered with a fundamental question. How do I live a life? And I affirm that you are here tonight because you may also be encountering that question. How do I live a life? Each of the great wisdom traditions emerged as an effort to order and provide guidance to that question, how do I live a life? And more personally, how do I live my life? My one unique unrepeatable life in time and space and physicality. How do I live my life? Every human existence ought to have primitivity, but the primitive existence always contains a re-examination of the fundamental. What is the significance of the primitive genius? It is not so much to produce something absolutely new, for there is really nothing new under the sun, as it is to re-examine the universally human, the fundamental questions. This is honesty in the deepest sense. Instead of lecturing on the history of nations and of the human race, someone gets the ludicrous idea of occupying oneself with the problem of what it is to be a human being, whether we really are human beings, whether you and I are really human beings. All the great questions emerge whether you want them or not. Where did I come from? Why am I here? and where am I going? Those are the three questions that all major spiritual uh, uh, paths seek to deal with. Not necessarily to answer, but to explore for the implications of if there is no purpose, then what is morality about? And if there is, uh, if, I, if I came from nowhere, am I going nowhere? Perhaps, but how will that change your life? And, and what will happen to your own sense of humanity if, if the answer to that question means that uh, you have free reign uh, and you, no one has the right to expect anything of you or you of anyone else. Remember where you turn it. The search for truth, for the Dharma, or for a spiritual path almost always begins as the desire to solve some problem or answer some life question. Most of us begin to practice in an attempt to fill an empty place in our lives or to recover from an unhealthy way of living. In Buddhism, this aspiration to awaken is called bodhicitta, a term often translated into English as body-mind awakening mind, a way-seeking mind. There is way more than meets the eye to human experience. 
I often use the image of an iceberg, that you see about 10% of an iceberg above water and 90% is submerged. And that's how we are, like only 10% of what's happening in us is really visible or able to be known by our usual ways of knowing. But there's this whole other 90% that is happening underneath the surface and any spiritual path, any religion, spirituality, whatever you call it, a path to growing your heart and mind, it is essential, especially in this time where we are confronted with challenges no other generations of humans have encountered. It's essential to do that work of making that 90% visible or tangible or, or known because the reason we're in this trouble is because that 90% that isn't known has been driving us the harmful parts of it, the unconscious, the knotted, caught parts of our psyche, not just our individual, but our collective psyche, are what has brought us to this precipice as a species. And so this work is the most important work to get out of all the external situations of challenge, of climate change and racism and war. And the only way out is in is because until we untie those knots in ourselves, we won't be able to untie them in our world. And, and that's what the Buddha says in the Dhammapada. It's our mind that creates our reality. The only reason we have things happening the way they are in the world is because those exist in our minds. It's with our minds that we create the world. That's how it goes. And so any path, any path that takes us beneath the surface is what we need. Every human being would be infinitely powerful if they did not need to use two-thirds of their energy in finding one's task. Therefore, a child has so much energy because the parent sets the task and the child has only to obey. It is the dialectics of the task which really enervates. Each of us is born with half a magnet inside of us. I believe there is something in each of us that is pulling us onward. Now, you can't work with half a magnet. So there's something in here trying to get out, trying to get out under all circumstances, and then suddenly one day, slam. You meet the other half of the magnet and you're home. Why is that a problem then? Why would I start out with the notion that it's a problem? Because this culture teaches you to ignore the internal magnet at every level. This, this culture teaches our kids, uh, I, how, many, how many times have I had a young person say, I say, what, do you, what in God's name are you doing in math? You, here's, your, here's your report card. You were at best a C-plus student. You never mentioned that you wanted to be in math. You always told me you were going to be a history teacher. You, you, were, you wanted to go around the world. Yes, sister, but my dad said, you can't make any money being a third grade teacher. If you think I put all this money in your education and you're going to come out in elementary ed, then son, you pay for the rest of it yourself. What, do, what, are we, what did we just educate? An unhappy kid is what we're unleashing onto the world, a half-finished mind, a half-developed soul, a, a, a half-known personality, unknown even to this person themselves. This little magnet in me, I started uh, at the age of uh, eight uh, in, a, in the alley behind the house giving every kid on the block their own role in the movie I had just written. I told stories and had all these kids. Uh, nobody noticed it. I didn't notice it. Was the way to, it was the way I had fun, and everybody liked a role, and everybody went. That's one dimension. That's the magnet that meets the magnet. Now, how did I get to be a writer? The little eight-year-old loved to tell stories. I grew to the point where 
uh, I, 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 be, I became aware, I was made aware, I suddenly figured out that if that nun who was questioning me on who wrote my essay thought it was that good, that an adult could have written it, maybe I ought to meet her that night and see what else I might do. So here's, here is the stuff out of which our own clay is now being molded. We don't mold it ourselves. We only have half of that magnet. But that magnet, it's due north. It's, it's the rest of its compass is it's absolutely essential to the spiritual and psychological well-being of a person that we listen to the magnet, that we search for the other half of it, and that we not permit anything out here to give us a lesser value in life by which to direct our spiritual selves. There is an <laughs> internal path necessary to follow. Now, I'm not saying that everybody ought to be working in, in the path that is the fullness of themselves. Sometimes you work in order to follow the path in a different way. There are a lot of writers who work in banks adding numbers so that four o'clock in the morning they can get up and write for three hours before they go to the bank. The point is you must understand who you are and you must lead yourself to the fullness of that or I don't see how you can be fully happy and even fully holy. If I myself am ever to be whole, wholeness is a huge thing for me, huge. Do, do all your parts go together? That's the question. Is your mind and your soul and your work and your social life, are they all of a piece? Or are you playing cards with the mafia at, uh, over here and delivering soup uh, to, to the elderly over here? It doesn't go together. It doesn't fit. There's something unwhole about the way you're trying to move through life. Until you make the unconscious conscious, it will direct your life and you will call it fate. One does not become enlightened by imagining figures of light, but by making the darkness conscious. How do I live a life? I guess I was so busy being busy, I didn't pause long enough to consider this question, or the deeper question of how do I live my life as an awake being? Perhaps it is time for me to pause my busy life and consider this deeper path, this path of awakenment. I am ready to tread the razor's edge, balancing the terror of being a human being and the wonder of being a human being. Are you coming? <laughs>